Now, disciplining ourselves is not thought to be desired often by our culture now, and yet we value it, so it's kind of a strange phenomenon. Uh, there's a recent movie, if you didn't see it, I highly recommend it, War Room. Uh, if you didn't see it, I think you can get it now, watch it on DVD, whatever, or download it, whatever. But uh, it came out this year. The director uh, was Alex uh, Kendrick, and uh, he also helped write it. He said this about it. We called it War Room because, like the military, we should seek God for the right strategy before going into combat. By combat, I mean daily issues we face in our culture. Now, what's interesting about the movie is it was critically reviewed by the critics at first, and yet it's been a major success at the box office, which says that we don't really care what the critics think. I think about most things, don't you think? We end up deciding ourselves what we think. Oscar Wilde, talking about this subject of discipline, said, I can resist anything but temptation. And, I, and then someone else said, well, I, I wouldn't be tempted if temptation wasn't so tempting. And, and I think that's probably true for us all. And uh, a little boy, in, in connection with that, a little boy was in a grocery store many years ago, and he, he is standing near an open box of peanut butter cookies. Okay, you know, peanut butter cookies, and they were just, it was just an open box there. And the uh, grocery store manager looked at the boy standing real close to that, and he said, uh, now then, young man, uh, what are you up to? And the young man said, uh, nothing, sir. He, he said, nothing. Well, it looks to me like you were trying to take a cookie. And he said, oh, you're so wrong, mister. I'm trying not to <laughs> take a cookie. I love uh, Tom Landry, or love Tom Landry. I thought he, he was a good coach, and he had some neat things to say. He said, uh, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they always wanted to be. I think that fits it pretty well. You remember Edmund Hillary, uh, one of the first men to conquer Mount Everest. Uh, he wasn't the first. The shepherds, uh, uh, Sherpers were the first to get there, but he was one of the first uh, in that crew. And he was interviewed about his passion for climbing mountains one time. Now, why did he feel that way? And he said, well, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. It's all about learning to conquer your own fears, I suppose. I'm not going to try that. Even if I was a young man, I, I wouldn't want to climb a mountain like that where there's no air. But Peter the Great of Russia uh, was quoted as saying, I have been able to conquer an empire, but I've not been able to conquer myself. And I think that's true for too many. Hugo Gratis, uh, a Dutch jurist and, and uh, scholar, said, A man cannot govern a nation if he cannot govern a city. He cannot govern a city if he cannot govern himself. And he cannot govern himself unless his passions are subject to reason. Let me commend to you a book. I don't recommend a lot of books, but I've recommended this one several times through the years. You may not have heard me recommend it, but I, I think it's an excellent book. It's by Richard Foster. Richard Foster. It's called Celebration of Discipline. It came out in the 70s, sometime in the 70s. I highly recommend it. I read it through a few times. Uh, not necessarily learned anything the way I should have, but read it through. So why do we need the disciplines? I think one of the reasons that we need it is because man actually prefers a religion where he has a mediator. Uh, for whatever reason, we prefer that someone else talk to God for us. Uh, we prefer that someone else study the Bible for us and then lay something in front of us where it's easy for us to get it. We prefer someone else to do our visiting for us. So we try to hire people to do that kind of thing. 
Uh, Exodus 20, 19, they did not want to hear any more direct communication from God. So they said, Moses, you go talk to God and you tell us what he says. I think that's our nature. Uh, we, don't we say we want to be in God's presence, but it's a little daunting. And I think because that we are in a civil war within ourselves, uh, we need the disciplines. And, and you really need to listen to this. Fixing America without fixing ourselves is like saving everybody else's children and losing our own. It, it's silly to try to worry about America if we're not disciplining ourselves. And America will learn self-discipline when all of us learn it first. There are pitfalls that you need to avoid in discussing Christian disciplines. Uh, there are several. Uh, it is a dangerous thing to think that our disciplines will be a way of attaining some kind of higher spirituality. It's a mistake to think that if you prayed three times and somebody else prayed once, that you're more spiritual because you prayed three times. You may have prayed three times because you've got a problem, and they may have prayed once because they didn't. It may have had nothing to do with your spiritual level. It's also dangerous to turn the disciplines into some kind of law, that you've got to do X, Y, and Z to be right with God. What you don't find in the Scriptures is an exact schedule on how to conduct the disciplines. It doesn't exist. To fail to see the social implications of spiritual disciplines is also a mistake. We should wage peace as the body of Christ. While the world wants to wage war, we should wage peace. And we should plead for justice, particularly for the underdogs and the poor and the disinherited of the world. That's our place. Who else is going to do it if we don't do it? So these disciplines should drive us inward to, to become people who are activists, but for the underdog, not for the fight in the street. Uh, to view the disciplines as virtuous in themselves is a mistake. Prayer is not a virtue. It's not. That's not a virtue. It's a thing that can help you attain to virtue, excellence in character, but in and of itself is not a virtue. It's a discipline. Uh, to center on the disciplines rather than on Christ is a mistake. Some people, they want to talk about all these disciplines and they forget that the whole purpose of disciplines, spiritual disciplines, is to attain to a deeper level with Christ. And to isolate and elevate one discipline over the others is a mistake. It's the idea of, well, I do this one, but you just do that one. That's a mistake. And, and to think that such discussions as we're going to have tonight is exhaustive. And what we're going to look at is just going to cover it all. No, 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 that's not true. And, or to study the disciplines without experiencing them. We're going to look at them tonight. But if you never tried these things, what a waste, right? So let's look at the, uh, just eight tonight. I uh, didn't even cover that. Let's look at the eight, and, uh, and I think that it could be a blessing to you. Number one is meditation. Psalm 63, verse 6. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Just thinking on God. That's one form of meditation. Two words are in the Bible for meditation, and they appear together 58 times. So we need to learn to prepare to meditate. To prepare to meditate, and meditation is a good thing to do. A lot of people have given it up. Part of the reason because the schedules are so tight now. But if you can take a moment every day to just meditate, here's some things to meditate on. You can meditate on the revelation of God, center on internalizing a particular passage. Just let it center down on you. You can meditate on submission. One of the neat ones that I learned from uh, uh, Catholic monks that I've always loved is called palms up, palms down. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. A good form of meditation. You sit quietly with your hands down 
and because your hand's down, it's as if you are dropping all your cares on the floor. And then turn your palms up as if you are receiving blessings from the Lord. The only reason you do that is because it helps you think through the process. Not because it actually does anything, but it helps you think through the process. And it keeps you centered and focused while you're thinking. Uh, meditate on the creation. One of the things that the monks used to do is they'd take something like a flower or they'd take a, uh, a, 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 something like a, a leaf or even an animal for that matter and they would place it before them and they would focus on it in a way that made them appreciate the great work that God had done and just sit and look at it for a time. Nature has a way of blessing your heart. You've seen a sunrise, you've seen a sunset, those are not the only beautiful things out there. There are billions of beautiful things out there and uh, it will give peace to your soul. Or you meditate on conditions. Some people will take like a newspaper. I don't, I don't know if this brings peace, but people will take a newspaper or they'll watch the news and they'll go out and they'll meditate. What are the implications on what they've just seen happening in our world and what is God doing and trying to understand what God is doing in the middle. That's meditation. So of all the spiritual disciplines, uh, you need to learn, learn this uh, war room discipline in uh, meditation and try to do more of that. Second one is prayer. In Luke 11 and verse 1 it says, Now it came to pass as he was praying at a certain place, when he ceased, he's talking about Jesus, that one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. The first and the greatest lesson you need to learn about prayer from that little verse right there that I learned, and it's really blessed my heart, and I think it'll bless yours if you just get this simple little truth, and that is that prayer involves a learning process. So experiment. Don't be afraid to try something. Do something different. Sit in a different position. Go to a different location. Pray a different way. Pray backwards to what you normally pray. And I don't mean the words backwards, but I mean, uh, you know, uh, say it the opposite direction of the way you would normally start it. Uh, prepare yourself to pray. And one of the ways you can prepare yourself to pray is to know that God answers your prayers. Because, I mean, Jesus prayed, right? I mean, he prayed after his baptism. He prayed before his baptism. Uh, selecting his apostles. He, uh, before he asked his apostles, who do the men say that I the Son of Man am? Before uh, he multiplied the, the loaves and the fishes, before his transfiguration, before his crucifixion, before his death, while on the cross. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed. He prayed all night long when he was selecting his apostles. And know that God answers prayer because Jesus commanded us to pray. Ask, seek, knock. Because God answers is what he says over and over again. And know that God answers prayer because Jesus was crucified. One of the greatest arguments for answered prayer is Romans 8 and verse 32. If God allowed his son to die on the cross, this is the argument he makes. If God allowed his son to die on the cross for you, how will he not with him also freely give you all things? What is it that he would hold back from you? if he'd let his son die for you. You can't ask anything on that level. That's why you can't, it's above all that you can ask or think. You can't even think of anything bigger than that because there is nothing bigger than that. That's why you can't think of anything. And know that God answers prayer because Jesus, church, prayed. I mean, we had a, a, a study on this in Acts chapter 12 not long ago about how they all prayed and Peter was released. Do you remember that? It was not that long ago we prayed. So, and know that God answers prayer because Jesus cares. In fact, 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 says, Cast your care on him because he cares. He actually does care. He cares, kids, by the way, whether you make a C or an A. So it's okay to pray. You're facing a test, I highly recommend it. I pray. Amen. Yeah, I pray for it going to elders' meetings. Of all, Spiritual disciplines, you need to learn the war room discipline of prayer. And then the third one is fasting. In Matthew chapter 6 and 17, but you, and I, I know some of you say, well, I don't believe you have to fast. Well, that's right. You don't have to pray either. And you don't have to meditate either. There ain't nobody going to force you to do any of these things. You do these things because you want to do them. 
and their disciplines and within and of itself. You say, well, I ain't prayed in a week. Well, you may be weaker because of it, but you might not be because of the circumstances you're in. It doesn't always correlate. So, but you say, well, I don't think we're supposed to fast. Well, let me give you the reason I believe we're supposed to. Matthew 6, 17. But you, when you fast. When. Jesus assumed you would. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Not you must fast, but when you do it, because you will eventually get around to it. When you do it, do it the right way. So how do you prepare to fast? Well, you probably need to know the seven, eight, or ten reasons that you it's a good idea to fast. Isaiah 58 verse 4 gives two. One is to be heard by God on high. God is more likely to listen to you if you're fasting and praying. And then to break the bonds of wickedness. You're more likely to be able to get out from underneath a wicked addiction you have if you fast. That's what it says. In Luke chapter 2 verse 37 and Acts 13 verses 2 and 3, it indicates that fasting is one of the ways we just worship God. You can come to church and if you don't eat during the service, okay, and then, right? You know, putting all jokes aside, did you know that it's not uncommon for people to believe that you're not to eat anything before you take the Lord's Supper. That's actually a pretty common thinking. So it is kind of a fast, believe it or not. In Matthew 9, verse 15, one of the reasons we fast is to sorrow. We're grieving over someone. Another reason, Daniel chapter 10, is to understand God's will. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. In Ezra 8, in 2 Chronicles 20, and Joel chapter 2, it was to seek God's help in a very special or critical time. In Jonah chapter 3, in Acts 9, it is to repent sorrowfully for God to help me repent, which is similar to the thing of breaking the bonds of wickedness. In Psalm 35 and Psalm 69, it was to humble and to discipline ourselves. So sometimes it's to humble ourselves and sometimes it's to discipline our own body and to bring it into submission. In John chapter 4 and Mark, Matthew chapter 4, it's to feast on God, to spend time just with God and His Word and His work and not to give any effort to preparing meals, going out and killing anything or whatever in that day particularly or going to the grocery store, but just to spend some time with God. So those are some reasons of all the spiritual disciplines. You need to learn this one, and that is to your advantage, and it doesn't make you more spiritual if you fasted, but it can help. And just because you fasted doesn't make you better. Well, I went two days. Woo-hoo. That's not what it's about. It's about helping you. Number four or up there is a study. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 17 says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You need to prepare to study. You need to learn a couple of things about study. One of the best ways to study, in my opinion, is to read the Bible out loud or to hear it read out loud. If, y'all, if you don't want to do it, get you one of these little apps and let it read to you out loud. There's something about seeing it and hearing it simultaneously that it does something to you that just reading it silently doesn't do. Read other versions. I know that goes down wrong to some people, but read other versions. Uh, Get other people's comments on it. Read other people's books on it. And read it with other people. And then talk about it because what other people say is not what you're going to think. And it's good for you. Uh, Memorize some verses. It wouldn't kill us to memorize some verses. Well, obviously, the best way to memorize a verse is having studied it so much you can't help but remember it. Here's one, for example. You, you might not remember it right now, but you will in a moment. Uh, it's John eleven thirty five. 35. I'll give you the first word, Jesus. Wept. That's it. You did it. So you memorized the verse already. So you can do it. Uh, Jesus wept. That's a good one. All right? So you can, you can memorize Scripture. It, it's not that impossible. Uh, study specific words or characters or doctrines or historical events. I Believe it or not, I'm constantly, you ask my wife about this because I drive her nuts about it, but I'm constantly studying things that I, I'll never talk to you about. And, and, and it's important to do that. I study, th- study kind of on the edge of some stuff that I'll never, I won't even talk to elders about it. I won't even talk to anybody about it. Right. I study kind of on the edge because I want to make sure that what we're believing is true and so I'll look in, I'll look underneath the rock. I think it's my duty to, to risk me, not you. You know what I'm saying? And to do that for your sake. 
And because uh, I just want to be 100% sure of everything we believe. Amen? And uh, I, I like the thought of that. And uh, it, it's not always fun, but it might be in all of our best interest. Uh, make notes and keep journals on all that you learn and observe. I think that's healthy, right? Write your learn what you learn down uh, or text it into your computer, whatever. Uh, so of all the spiritual disciplines, learn this war room discipline of just study. Next one is on the next line, simplicity. Uh, I'm going to try to pace, pace this a little faster. Matthew 6, says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So we need to learn to live a more simple life, in my opinion. I think we're, we've slid away from that. Uh, maybe you should buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. Uh, I probably went the wrong place there. But uh, it, it doesn't matter what the emblem is on the vehicle. It's whether or not it runs and whether or not it gets you from point A to point B. It really is. Uh, reject anything that's producing an addiction in you. Uh, you got a problem with uh, whatever, drugs or alcohol or cigarettes or whatever. You need it or, or your mouth. Uh, develop the habit of giving things away. Uh, just give it away. Amen? Uh, there's so much stuff. If you started giving your stuff away right now, you, you, if you're like most of us, you've got so much junk, you're going to get depressed trying to give it away. You're going to find stuff. So what in the world is this doing in here? You will not be able to give it all away. But you can try uh, refuse to be propagandized and made to hunger for the, the latest fad or gadgetry. You don't have to have the iPhone 7 the day it comes out. Seriously? You really don't. You don't have to stay up all night. I can't say much about that. I'm going to see the Jedi's on the night it comes out. All right, so... Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Amen? It, it's okay to go window shopping still. Amen? I know you can't go window shopping. I mean, you walk through the mall and just say, uh -huh, look at how much that costs. And they're buying it. They're crazy. And then just keep walking. Uh, develop a deeper appreciation for the creation itself. Maybe you could just go camping. Uh, I hate camping, but I'd go with you. You know, just, you know. Y'all like camping? Anybody here like? Raise your hand if you like camping. There are crazy people here. Okay, so have a healthy skepticism about all buy now, pay later things. Amen? Who needs, I mean, credit cards, right? Let's just get one more credit card, right? Just one more. If I had one more, then I could, yeah, that's just crazy. So of all the spiritual disciplines, learn this war room discipline of simplicity. Just seek first the kingdom of God. Don't keep... Add layers to you. And then the next one is solitude. And Matthew 6 and verse 6 says, But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you shut your door, pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Amen. Go find some solitude. Take some days where you don't spend any time with anybody. I, I'm kind of a recluse anyway. If you come to the office, you'll find me back in the back room. I'll close the door and I don't want to talk to anybody. But... Uh, I mean, that's kind of the way I like being alone. I was kind of raised alone. I've been in the woods alone. Spent a lot of time out there alone. I like being alone. It's great. Uh, but not everybody does that. And you would do well to find time for some solitude, a quiet place. Discipline yourself to speak fewer words or, or maybe no words. Spend a day in no words. And just tell your wife up front, I'm not going to say anything today. Well, you've already messed up. But um, spend a solitude time in allowing God's presence to help you to set some goals and have planned retreats to study or to pray, to go with groups, go with the men, go with the ladies, but find some solitude during that time. It doesn't always have to be interaction time. Some of the best thing we can do is do that, believe it or not, because we don't get a lot of that. In our culture. So of all the spiritual disciplines, learn the war room discipline of solitude. Next one is submission. Uh, it says in Ephesians 5, 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Uh, you need to learn to submit to God as an act of prayer. That's submission because he says we need to do it. 
uh, submit to God by submitting to the scriptures and it's called to obedience. It's called to be read. Submit to your family and to their needs. Submit to your neighbors and the daily needs they may have around. You see a rake laying in their yard, go over there and put their rake up for them. You know what I mean? Just submit to their needs. Uh, submit to the church and its needs. I know we, we have fellowships here. Believe it or not, somebody is going to take the trash out. It wouldn't hurt if one time you volunteered to do that. Amen? Uh, or volunteer to help back there on uh, when we have the eats every Sunday. It wouldn't hurt for you to volunteer to take a turn. It wouldn't kill you. Uh, it'd be good for you. Submit to uh, the broken and the despised and their needs. Don't, don't just spend time with the cool people at church. Go find a wallflower. Amen? Go find somebody that nobody's talking to. And if you're the one, go find somebody else that nobody's talking to. You know? Submit to the world and its needs and world missions. So of all the spiritual disciplines, learn this discipline of submission. And then finally, service. This is really important. This is close to what I was just saying. Mark chapter 10, verse 43. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. But you've got to be careful. Don't become a self-righteous servant, okay? That's, that's a real problem. Sometimes we do that. Uh, if you start thinking that you're getting ahead through some kind of human effort and you're better than others because you did something at church, that's not true. That's not what I was calling to you to a minute ago. Just because you take the garbage out does not mean you're more spiritual than the guy who didn't, okay? That isn't what I was saying. It's just it's something that needs to be done, right? And it's nice to help. Uh, it seeks to make impressive gains sometimes on religious scoreboards. Well, how big's your church? Well, how big's your church? Who cares? You know, that doesn't matter. It requires external rewards and needs to be recognized. I didn't get a plaque. Nobody said thank you for what I did. I went up there and I worked for hours and not one word. Who cares? God's watching, and one day he'll say something to you about it, okay? And that should be enough. It, it, it's highly concerned about results and numbers. And uh, well, if you didn't baptize X many people, you're not a, a Christian. It, it picks and chooses whom to serve. If you're going to serve, you can't care who needs the help, amen? You just help. Uh, it affects by moods and whims. Well, I don't feel like serving right now. Well, that, that's not the point. That's self-righteous. And, and if it's temporary function where I just do it today, but I'll never do it again, it's not really service, is it? It's just plugging in for the day. It, it insists on meeting a need even when to do so might actually hurt somebody's feelings. I'm going to give you this bunch of groceries, but we don't need it. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Excuse me. So it's all about you. It isn't about helping the person. Do you understand what I mean? You don't want to ever embarrass somebody or force your help on someone. If they don't want it, it's okay. And it can fracture communities. So here's some things to remember to do as humble service. Humble service will serve in hiddenness. No one will even know. And it'll still do it. It'll serve in small things that hardly anybody even saw. It'll serve in guarding the reputation of an individual, just simply not sharing something. That's an act of service. It'll serve by being served. Allowing somebody to serve you is an act of service. It'll serve by being courteous, letting somebody in, but not everybody in the line, amen? It'll serve by being hospitable, Taking somebody out, bringing somebody into your house, listening to someone, bearing their burdens, and sharing the word with someone else. So those are just some disciplines. And none of them are absolutes that if you don't do it, you're not right with God. I didn't mean anything that I said tonight like that. Please forgive me if I left you with that impression. It was not my intent. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. It's just in your best interest. It really is. Is it not moving? Did it move? And I kept, it wouldn't move up here. Okay, let me go back. That. There's a study done by Angela Duckworth and Martin Siegelman. Uh, they're with the University of Pennsylvania in the Positive Psychology Center. 
they studied 140 school children 13 years old. And they started at the beginning of the academic year and they gave them this long uh, questionnaire both to the parents and to the children, the parents and the teachers and the children, and they all completed these questionnaires about the children's self-discipline. Uh, the measures asked things about the child's ability to follow rules, to avoid acting impulsively, and to put off instant reward for later gratification. Scores from the different uh, measures were combined to create an overall indicator of self-discipline, and the researchers found that self-discipline predicted all sorts of academic measures taken seven months later, including the children's average grade for the academic year could be predicted their spring exam results, and their selection into high school. They went on to study another group of children the same age, 164 children, age 13 again, similar procedures, all the same questions, except they also included a, uh, a study on their IQ to get their IQ results. All of that was again evaluated. The children's self-discipline scores accounted for twice as much of the variation in their later academic performance rather than their IQs. Stop bragging about your kid's IQ. It isn't your child's IQ that will make them a good person. It's whether or not they learn personal discipline. Are you listening? You will succeed in almost anything on this planet if you can learn to discipline yourself you're far, far, far more likely to accomplish good things in school and every other aspect of your life to learn simple personal discipline. Complete your work. Get what you have to do done next done. That simple kind of discipline, getting up on time, going to bed on time, those simple disciplines, if you, will, you want to get your kids grade up, forget that. Forget that. Teach them personal discipline. It will solve that problem. That's what I'm trying to suggest. You want to solve your spiritual problems? Quit trying to say, I prayed more than you. Get some personal discipline. Just personal spiritual discipline will do more good for you in all aspects of your life than anything I can recommend to you tonight. And not one of those were best. They're just among the good things to do. You're here tonight, and you haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus. The place to begin is there, is it not? To take that first step to live for the Lord. Won't you do that tonight? Repenting of your sins, confessing the name of Christ, being baptized, that would be the greatest first step in personal discipline you could make. Won't you come as we stand here while we sing?